Welcome to Decoding Superhuman. This show is a deep dive into obsessions with performance and how to improve the human experience. Twice a week, I explore the latest science, technology, and tactics with experts in various fields of human optimization. I'm your host, Boomer Anderson. Enjoy the journey. Superhumans! It's Boomer Anderson. We are back today. And my guest, he really needs no introduction. But I'll give it to you anyway. My guest today is Dr. Stephen Gundry, and he's probably best known for his work as a cardiothoracic surgeon and heart surgeon. Dr. Gundry has worked in medicine for over 40 years, is the director and founder of the International Heart and Lung Institute, as well as the Center for Restorative Medicine in Palm Springs and Santa Barbara, California, both beautiful places. His education includes a pre-med at Yale University, medical school at Medical College of Georgia, and his residency, well, surgical residency, was at the University of Michigan, where he participated in a prestigious research program run by the National Institute of Health. Dr. Gundry was one of the first 20 surgeons to test the implantable left ventricular assist device, which is really a type of artificial heart, something I didn't know. And he's also got patents on numerous medical devices. If that wasn't enough, he has written over 300 articles or chapters in books, and he has published, well now, several international best-selling books. These include Dr. Gundry's Diet Evolution, The Plant Paradox, The Plant Paradox Cookbook, and his latest, The Longevity Paradox. This conversation with Dr. Gundry is something I've wanted to talk to him about, or really filled with questions that I've wanted to ask him for a long time. I originally intended to discuss both lipopolysaccharides as well as lectins, but given the time limit in Dr. Gundry's schedule, we only got to one of those, and that was lectins. When the plant paradox came out, it turned the health world on its head, talking a little bit about why we should avoid lectins and why there are certain types of lectins that are worse than others. So of course we cover that in today's podcast. We get into how to test for lectins. Are there any genetic predispositions that make you more lectin sensitive? We talk about the carnivore diet, peptides, and of course, at the end, because he mentions it, we get into alcohol. The show notes for this one are at decodingsuperhuman.com slash Dr. Gundry, and enjoy my conversation with Dr. Stephen Gundry. Dr. Gundry. This is an absolute pleasure. Thank you for joining. Hey, pleasure to be here. So I want to get things started with a concept that has been brought to my attention a few times on this podcast, which is the holobiome. And I know you discuss it a little bit in your latest book. Do you mind just educating us? What is the holobiome? Well, most of us have heard by now the term microbiome, Mm -hmm. uh, which refers to the bugs that that live in our gut and actually the microbiome is getting further divided into the mycobiome which (laughs) is the fungi that live in our gut Uh, but there are also a a complete set of flora that live in our mouth that live in our nose that live on our skin uh, live in the genital tract in women and probably in men as well and this and there's actually a cloud of bacteria and viruses that surround us, and people have coined the term holobiome, and I actually like that term a whole lot better than microbiome. So I I use it in the longevity paradox quite a bit, but it's okay if most people think it's the microbiome. Um, The reason I think it's a better term is there's, there's more and more evidence that the oral microbiome uh, and it has a huge effect not only on coronary artery disease but more and more on dementia and alzheimer's and there is such a thing that dale bredesen who wrote the end of alzheimer's and i describe as leaky mouth most people are aware of leaky gut mm-hmm. but leaky mouth may actually be maybe more important in terms of uh, dementia than leaky gut 
Wow. Oh, okay. So leaky mouth sounds like it could be the next trend after, you know, leaky brains catching on lately. It's pretty soon yep. leaky mouth is going to catch on, but I want to talk a little bit about the longevity paradox and a couple of things that you've brought up and have been quite well known for turning the health world on its head. Uh, lectins and then lipopolysaccharides. First, I would love to just dive a little bit into lectins. Uh, for those who are unfamiliar, if you don't mind just talking a little bit about lectins, what they are, and then why are they a problem? So lectins are part of the plant defense system against being eaten. And one of the hardest things to convince people is that plants have a life and that plants uh, do not want to be eaten. They were not put here on earth for us to munch on them. And they want to grow, and they want their babies, their seeds to grow. So they use, as part of their defense system, uh, proteins that are called lectins. Some people think I'm saying leptin, the anti-hunger <laughs> hormone. Some people think I'm saying lecithin, the emollient in so many of our foods. But it's lectins. Uh, these are sticky proteins that look for specific sugar molecules to bind to. And we actually know what those sugar molecules are. Uh, these sugar molecules line the lining of our intestines. They line the lining of our joints. They actually line the space between two nerve endings. They line the blood vessels that all of us have. And in the theory of why lectins cause disease, lectins seek out these spots. There's very good experimental evidence and clinical evidence that I've published that lectins are capable of causing leaky gut and are probably the major cause of leaky gut. This was first discovered by Dr. Fasano from Johns Hopkins University in explaining how gluten works. Just so that everybody's oriented, gluten happens to be a lectin. And <laughs> so when people say, well, lectins don't cause a problem, well, actually, uh, they do. Mm -hmm. And gluten is just one of many lectins. In fact, in, if I was going to have a hierarchy of mischievous lectins, gluten would actually be towards the bottom. Um, and we can talk about that if you want. So that's in a nutshell what lectins do. So if they stick to a substance, they are basically a foreign protein, a splinter. And anybody's had a splinter under their skin and it gets all red. And that's our white blood cells, our immune system attacking that foreign protein, that splinter. So Lectins are foreign proteins, and they are attacked wherever they attach. And again, there's really good evidence that uh, leaky gut, uh, which can and is caused by lectin ingestion, is a major cause of aging, period. Mm -hmm. um, they are a major cause of arthritis. They are a major cause, in my opinion, and I've recently published two papers, of coronary artery disease. Uh, the uh, new paper out last week suggests that osteoporosis is caused by leaky gut. And in this particular paper, it was caused by gluten. So, uh, you know, we have an epidemic of mm -hmm. osteoporosis and osteopenia, including in men now, which was never seen. And uh, I think we just put it at the doormat of lectins and go from there. Why are we only now starting to come to this knowledge of lectins? Because lectins have been around, or at least from my research, since 1880, 1884-ish. Right. What, what uh, I know you've really driven, been the driving force behind bringing lectins to light. Why do you think it now is the right time or the time? Yeah, and I, I'm certainly not the first to make, a, to make an issue about lectins. It's interesting, the, the blood type diet. Um, was uh, a lectin, an anti-lectin diet. It was uh, couched in blood type, but it was actually a lectin elimination diet. And it wasn't sexy enough to make it a lectin elimination diet, so it was a blood type diet, but it was uh, a lectin elimination diet by uh, Dr. D'Amato. 
Uh, I think I brought it to the forefront because uh, in The Plant Paradox, my original book, I pointed out that there were seven deadly disruptors in our society now that have allowed lectins to become mischievous. We, we have a very good defense system against plant lectins, and it actually has to do with stomach acid. Uh, lectins are protein that can be dissolved by stomach acid. But more importantly, uh, the microbiome, getting back to the microbiome, there are bacteria that actually enjoy eating lectins. There's even a bacteria that likes to eat gluten. But two things have happened. Number one, the overuse of broad-spectrum antibiotics, both in humans and probably more importantly in animals that we eat. Um, there's animal, there are antibiotic residues, at least in the United States, in most of our beef, most of our pork, uh, most of our chickens. There's a little backing up on chickens right now, but uh, these antibiotics kill uh, the microbiome. And so you, you've really lost that part of the defense system. Another, I think, important thing is the use of antacids and uh, acid-producing uh, acid in our stomach is essential to break down lectins. And with the widespread use now of over-the-counter proton pump inhibitors, um, we're seeing huge numbers of people with thinking that to get rid of heartburn, they need to take these things, but they're stopping acid production. And so they're just letting lectins loose uh, into us. I think the third thing, and I won't bore the listeners with all seven, the third thing I think that's important is the overuse of non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs, uh, NSAIDs. Mm -hmm. And these are the popular painkillers like ibuprofen and, and naproxen that are over the counter. We even have them for children. And drug companies have known and have published data that these act like ha swallowing a hand grenade. They actually blow holes in the wall of our intestines. Uh, just one no, will do it. And uh, these things are ubiquitous. Wow. So I, I think those three are why. <clears throat> excuse me, lectins uh, have become problematic and where, whereby they won't be in other cultures. Uh, one fourth thing, sorry, I'm on a roll. Go for Glyph it. Glyphosate, mm -hmm. uh, Roundup. Uh, Roundup's been around now for 50 years. It used to be used for GMO plants. It's now used as a desiccant uh, to dry and kill a plant for harvest. So it's used in almost all American wheat, almost all American corn, soybeans, oats, uh, flax, sorry, not flax, canola. And so uh, these products are fed to animals, and glyphosate is in animals that we then eat, but it's in almost all the products that we consume that are based primarily on grains. Uh, they're in almost every oatmeal product in the United States. They're sadly in almost all California wines. And the important thing about glyphosate is that glyphosate was patented by Monsanto as an antibiotic. It was not patented as an herbicide. Mm -hmm. And gee, I guess they knew something. <laughs> so glyphosate is just wonderful for killing off your holobiome. Mm -hmm. And through work from MIT, glyphosate by itself is capable of causing leaky gut without any other necessity for anything else. So it's, it's kind of a perfect storm. And, you know, Europeans luckily are beginning to realize this. I think Belgium this coming year, 2020, will ban Roundup. And I mm -hmm. think Germany is right behind. But there's tremendous economic pressure, uh, particularly brought by Bayer, which now owns Monsanto, uh, in the EU to continue to keep Roundup um, actively used in, in crops. So I want to come back to this in one second, because I'm sure there are a few wine drinkers listening to this show that are heartbroken that California Cabernet may not be available to them anymore. But... <laughs> One of the things you said earlier about the mischievous lectins, my understanding is, is that not all lectins are created equal. 
and that right. some we should definitely avoid. And you're mentioning that gluten is at the bottom of that list, which is probably the most popular of the bunch. Can you go through some of the other ones and just what types of foods we should be definitely avoiding? So as a general rule, um, lectins are in almost all grains and pseudo grains. Um, there's two grains that do not contain lectins and because they have a halt. And a great number of lectins are actually on the outside of the seed. And so one of the worst <clears throat> of the lectins is called wheat germ gluten. Mm -hmm. And everybody thinks that wheat germ is really good for you. Well, wheat germ gluten is a lectin, but it's a, actually an incredibly tiny lectin of protein. And it's capable of diffusing across the gut wall without the need for leaky gut. Most lectins are actually very large proteins, and they're not capable of being absorbed. Um, and so they actually have to produce a leak in the gut to get into the body. Uh, and believe it or not, gluten is one of these larger lectins. But wheat germ gluten is capable of diffusion without any problem. The problem with wheat germ gluten is it is a insulin-like molecule, and wheat germagglutinin has been shown to attach to insulin receptors in muscle and even nerves and block the effect of insulin. It also attaches to the insulin receptor in fat cells, and actually, in that case, actually ushers in almost continuously sugar to be turned into fat. And as I talk about in the plant paradox and the longevity paradox, I happen to think that grain, particularly wheat and rye uh, and, uh, and oats became popular because they allowed more weight gain per calorie consumed than just about any other food. And back when there wasn't much food, anything that was capable of helping you gain weight would be a winner even mm -hmm. if it was making you achy or sick or depressed. If you had weight on you, you'd survive and have babies. Evolutionary pressures work really well. So aside from, uh, okay, WGA is something that we should all avoid from a broad yeah, and, and, and the, you know, And the point of all this is if you whole grains, um, really only became popular about 50 years ago, maybe mm -hmm. even less. Uh, Europeans have been smart enough for years to throw the haul away of wheat and rye mm -hmm. because that's where the mischief is. Uh, you know, a Frenchman eating a whole grain baguette or a whole grain croissant is just kind of, really? <laughs> and, and, you know, up until... American tourists showed up in Italy, the idea that you would have whole grain pasta is just an anathema to mm -hmm. an Italian. And so these cultures for thousands and thousands of years have been throwing the hall away. Rice has only been cultivated for 8,000 years and 4 billion people use rice as their staple, but most of them take the hall off of brown rice and eat it white. Mm -hmm. Now, how could they be that stupid? Because everybody knows how good brown rice is for you. Uh, At least well, that's what they tell me. <laughs> yeah. And you, I can't tell you the number of vegans who uh, I see with autoimmune diseases. And it's the brown rice that was one of the big culprits for them. And when we get rid of their brown rice, um, among other things, they get better, which leads me to the other things. Beans have. Beans and legumes have probably the highest lectin content of, of any food group. Now, it's possible to kill, destroy lectins with pressure cooking. Uh, certainly soaking, the tradition of soaking and changing the water uh, multiple times over 24, 48 hours is effective in diminishing the amount of lectins, but it's not perfect. Uh, and again, when you look at traditional cultures on how they've figured out how to deactivate or destroy most lectins. Soaking is huge. Uh, fermentation, the bacterial action on 
grains, for instance, quinoa, most people don't realize the Incas had three detoxification processes to get the lectins out of quinoa. They soaked it for 48 hours. They then allowed it to ferment and then they cooked it. And it's not on the package directions. So, um, you know, these aren't, we say, oh, you know, the Incas thrived on quinoa. Well, yeah, they knew how to handle these, these mischievous compounds. They didn't know why they were doing it, but they knew that if this happened, they weren't sick. And if they didn't do it, they were sick. This is fascinating. And, you know, maybe it's just our, our own laziness with the quinoa that we didn't figure this out. But can we transition a little bit into how to test for lectin sensitivity? Because, you know, I've heard you mention before TNF alpha is sort of a way to test for it, but also adiponectin. Yeah. Are there other tests that we should be using and why those two? Well, I wrote a paper years ago uh, looking at people with elevated adiponectin levels. Uh, Most people, if they know about adiponectin, which is a hormone, it's associated uh, with good things, uh, being thin, lack of insulin resistance. but The literature is also replete with human examples that people with rheumatoid arthritis and autoimmune disease have elevated adiponectin levels, which makes sense. There's a very large study out of the United States, uh, the Women's Health Initiative, that showed that skinny women with high adiponectin levels had a very high incidence of dementia and Alzheimer's disease. That That doesn't make sense if this hormone is so good for you. So I looked at a large number of people, I think it was 800 or so, who had uh, an elevated adiponectin level, and it was using one lab. There's different measurements throughout labs. Mm -hmm. But in this lab, uh, 16 and above was where our cutoff was. And then we looked at TNF-alpha levels, which is an inflammatory cytokine, tumor necrosis factor alpha. And we showed that If we took lectins away from this population, then their TNF-alpha level would fall to normal. And subsequently, we've shown that their autoimmune disease, for the most part, biomarkers of autoimmune disease, 94% of 102 people followed for six months were biomarker negative for their autoimmune disease and were off of all immunosuppressant drugs. Not a bad. (laughs) <laughs> outcome. Pretty good return. Um, I there's there's a company uh, out of the United States called Vibrant America uh, that has developed a lectin uh, sensitivity test, and it's got a really dumb name. It's called the Lectin Zoomer. Um, <laughs> Uh, Somebody needs some they, branding work there. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Um, they well, they started with a test a few years ago called the Wheat Zoomer, which specifically looked for the components of wheat, and that's how they measure leaky gut, uh, among other things. And then they got they, they branched to a corn zoomer, a lectin zoomer, um, a dairy zoomer, an egg zoomer, and, and neuro zoomer, but. The interesting thing, we've been using that test now for over a year, and uh, they've they haven't published the data. I've seen it; it's actually very impressive. If you are sensitive on their tests to lectins, and they can actually figure out which specific ones you are sensitive to, you will have elevated markers of inflammation compared to people who are not sensitive to lectins. And I think it's actually, um, I think it's very, very important. These are human data. Mm-hmm. And uh, I mean, the correlation is incredibly strong. If you're, if you test positive for their tests uh, to lectins, you will have elevated uh, inflammatory markers. Is this something that the average person can buy over the counter or do you need a doctor to prescribe it? Yeah, at the the moment, you have to have a doctor to prescribe it, but any doctor Mm -hmm. can can order it. Um, It's it's, it's used to be a fairly expensive test. Each one of these tests individually were $199. If if you act today sort of thing, um, (laughs) 
four four or five of them are a hundred dollars a piece so like five of them are 4.99 mm-hmm. and again if you act today they will throw in a free food sensitivity panel as well um and uh, i'm i'm not uh, associated with them except i have done several uh, educational programs on their behalf because i'm so impressed with this technology mm-hmm. so, anyhow but that's not a pitch for them, but you ask, where can you find out? The other thing I think that's important to realize is that if you have an autoimmune disease or if you have a family history of an autoimmune disease, and interestingly, if you had a lot of tonsillitis or you've had your tonsils removed, the odds are really, really strong that you are sensitive to lectins. And uh, that's a, it's, a, it's a actually an easy way to judge it. Before I go on to a question about genetics, this is more of a personal one, uh, given my history with cardiovascular disease. You don't have time for that 45-minute jog. Frankly, who jogs anymore? You need something fast, efficient, and leaves you wanting more. My favorite tool for this, and I love it, is the Carol. She is a life-changing bike that provides you all the endurance you need in two 20-second bursts. Yes, you heard that correct. That's 40 seconds of max effort. Including the warm-up and cool-downs, you get a kick-ass workout in 8 minutes and 40 seconds. How? The Carol is a resistance bike powered by artificial intelligence, which personalizes and optimizes the resistance so you hit your maximum intensity levels and maximize glycogen depletion every single time. The proof is really in the pudding. Carol's effectiveness was independently verified by the American Council on Exercise. I gave the Carol bike a spin at Health Optimization Summit in London this year, and she kicked my ass so much that I had to get one. Check out Carol at carolfitai.com. That's C A R. O-L-F-I-T-A-I dot com. If you have limited time and want a kick-ass workout, which basically everyone that listens to this show does, use the code DECODING150 for a $150 discount. Head over to carolfitai.com to secure yours. Cardiovascular disease, do you consider it autoimmune condition? Uh, yes. Um, I mean, there are many theories of coronary artery disease or cardiovascular disease. And certainly the cholesterol theory of heart disease is a theory. We mm-hmm. must continue to remember that. There is the infectious theory of cardiovascular disease, which uh, I like a lot, and it gets actually back to leaky mouth. Uh, and then there's the autoimmune theory of cardiovascular disease, which I like a lot. And I think it's a combination probably of the three of these. But uh, in the last year, I've uh, presented two papers at the American Heart Association Institute, uh, uh, not Institute for Vascular Biology, the uh, vascular biology and thrombosis uh, sessions, where we've shown that there are some markers for lectins causing inflammation on the inside of blood vessels mediated by an inflammatory cytokine called IL-16. And we've shown that if you remove lectins from the diet, then IL-16 plummets and that a marker for five-year risk for coronary artery disease for actually a heart attack uh, called a pulse test, P-U-L-S, Um, that I have no relationship to, uh, the score, the risk score dramatically falls when you remove lectins from the diet and this marker goes down. So, yeah, I think there's now uh, published human data that uh, an autoimmune attack on blood vessels is uh, a part of this process. The other thing that I talk about in all my books is that there is a sugar molecule in uh, beef, lamb, and pork called new 5 g uh, that is different from the sugar molecule that lines our blood vessels, which is called new 5 ac and there won't be a test for your listeners, I promise, <laughs> uh, that we make an autoantibody to the lining of our blood vessels uh, when we encounter uh, 
new 5GC when we eat beef, lamb, and pork. And my personal feeling is that that explain that's all you need to have to explain why there are multiple studies associating red meat eating with increased cardiovascular disease. And it has nothing to do with the fat in meat. It has to do with this silly sugar molecule. And I and other researchers discovered the sugar molecule years ago when uh, we were doing xenotransplantation. Um, that's, for instance, a pig was our donor of choice. I actually still hold the longest record for a pig to baboon heart transplant. Wow. <laughs> um, in 28 days, actually. Wow. Um, so we, we attack this sugar molecule on the lining of a pig heart. And recently, which is total aside, uh, pigs have been gen genetically engineered to express the human sugar molecule rather than new 5GC. And it actually looks very exciting uh, wow. that this may break the log jam of why you don't see a whole lot of pig to human heart transplants. Mm -hmm. so, and it actually confirms the fact that it's this dumb sugar molecule that caused my animals to reject their pig heart, attacking their blood vessel. This is fascinating. And I could go down this wormhole for hours with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's not. Let, let's come back to the lectins at genetics. Are there genetics or any sort of gene snips that you see that in, in show increased in predisposition to lectin sensitivity? I don't. I'm not aware of any, um, there is certain, there's certainly a very strong family history component to this. Um, and it goes as far as family histories of eczema, asthma, atopic dermatitis, uh, lymphomas and leukemias. Uh, we, we see a number of people with lymphomas who uh, knock on wood, uh, when we get lectins out of their diet, um, we've had some excellent response rates to, to this. We've seen several people with multiple myeloma where getting lectins out of their diet was a, was a big step. Um, now, having, having said that, people with autoimmune diseases um, in general have to be pretty perfect on their diet. And sadly, in, in general, you can't cheat. Mm -hmm. And we, we actually have published this data as well. On the other hand, I just sent a uh, abstract in to the American Heart Association Lifestyle and Epidemiology Conference that I can't discuss, but it looks like um, if you kind of continue to keep lectins out of your diet, you will retrain your immune system to be tolerant to, um, to at least the lectins in wheat. Uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that, mm -hmm. uh, which is actually pretty exciting. So if I were to extrapolate a conclusion there, if you had somebody who was showing sensitivity to certain lectins but not others, an elimination diet for a period of time could potentially work. Is that right? Correct. And, uh, you know, the, my program is certainly an elimination diet. Mm -hmm. There are, you know, harder elimination diets. The, we joke that the carnivore diet, uh, which come on is, is an Atkins diet. Um, I'm going to come to that in a second and I've got a lot of questions there. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, a carnivore diet, if you actually were using grass fed, uh, grass finished animals and fish, wild fish, uh, is, I think, a very useful um, elimination diet. Do I think it's a great diet long term? Uh, no, but we could get into that uh, for a lot of reasons. Mm -hmm. But yeah, uh, there's, a, I think, with testing that we're doing, m most people can uh, do not react to A2 milk cheeses, for instance, um, they, most people do not react to eggs or egg yolks, but there are a subset of people in my practice that uh, have been really good on the plant paradox, but they still have issues with leaky gut or IBS or even an autoimmune disease that we can't quite tamp down. 
Mm-hmm. And these people, when we do this full testing, they're usually the ones that react to all forms of dairies or uh, all forms of egg. And when we take those out of that, things get better. And just something for everybody to just freak out about, there is actually a lectin in spinach uh, <laughs> called, called an aquaporin, which can be absolutely mischievous for some people in that doesn't mean don't go eat spinach. That's not what your listeners are hearing, uh, I hope. But we've actually taken spinach away from three people with uh, really nasty autoimmune diseases, and it's made a big difference for them. So. Mm-hmm. And in some cases, I imagine this is a permanent removal, but in most cases, is this like a 90-day removal? Or Yeah, we, we found... Uh, Long ago, I've been doing this for 20 years now. Long ago, I was pretty naive that, you know, you could cure leaky gut in maybe two weeks. Um, In general, uh, three to six months is is the usual time. I've had one woman take nine months to do it. Um, I had Will Cole on my podcast uh, last week. Um, He thinks that it could take up to two years. I haven't seen that in my practice but again there are some tough cookies out there what do you think of peptides as just potential for the i realize this is a little bit of the wild west if you will but peptides and their potential for healing not just leaky gut because we've seen this with like bpc 157 but also for somebody who has lectin sensitivity um I, I take a more, in a way, minimalist approach to all this. Um, number one, uh, my patient population is uh, insurance-based or Medicare-based. I even take uh, Medicaid, uh, Medi-Cal. Um, and so there, the ability of people to afford uh, exotic treatments, at least in my practice, was not in the cards. But I use the example, let's suppose you and I are out uh, in a boat on a canal in Amsterdam, and we spring a leak in the bottom of our boat, uh, and water is coming in. So we essentially have two choices. One is we grab a bucket and we start bailing. And I happen to think that most of the treatments for leaky gut is giving people buckets. And if you got more, a bigger hole, you need a bigger bucket. On the other hand, if lectins are one of the major causes of leaky gut, then to me, it's a lot easier to put your finger in the hole and stop water from coming in. And so I view taking lectins away as my finger in the hole. Mm -hmm. So far, um, that concept has worked very well for uh, tens of thousands of people uh, that I've seen. So would, you know, would peptides help? Sure, you know i i make a, I make a formula at Gundry MD, which I think is a superb formula for sealing leaky gut that does have some peptides in it called Total Restore. But there are lots and lots of other products, and I've seen people think that they could take one or more of these products, and that's all they have to do, and they don't have to change their eating habits. Mm-hmm. And at least for people with autoimmune diseases that that is not the, the perfect choice. Yeah. So that? that's perfect. And I think there's two questions that I want to ask you. We may not have enough time to get to these before we get to the rapid fire. Carnivore, why do you think it's so successful for people with autoimmune conditions and then you said long term maybe not the best idea? So, you know, I Uh, I've been complimented by several of the big carnivore advocates of convincing them how evil plants are. (laughs) And and, and it's true. Um, There are lectins in actually all plants. And my argument is that the longer you've known a lectin and eaten a lectin uh, and have a microbiome that's capable of eating that lectin, uh, the safer certain plants are for you, the more your immune system is educated. Fun fact, believe it or not, the Japanese have the only microbiome capable of digesting the cell wall of seaweed. And none, none of the rest of us have. And so that superfood's out the window. 
Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you can grind it up. I mean, that's why you have to break the, the cell wall of chlorella mm-hmm. for it to be useful. Because mm-hmm. you know, we we have no ability to digest the cell wall of plants. And believe it or not, cooking food was probably the real impetus to making us humans, uh, because we can break down the cell wall of plants with cooking. So that's an aside. So uh, the carnivore diet, um, I mean, let's let's give credit where credit is due. Actually, the original car- carnivore diet was described by uh, Samuelson back in before Atkins, and it was called the drinking man's diet. And uh, he was an aerial photographer, and he had a little book that sold two and a half million copies. And he basically says, all you're going to do is eat meat and eggs and Bernays sauce, and you're going to have a couple martinis. And he realized that uh, straight alcohol uh, had no carbohydrates. And uh, he became wildly popular. He was described uh, by Harvard nutritionists as a mass murderer. (laughs) <laughs> and uh, he actually had the last laugh. He uh, died at 96, which is a pretty doggone good run. He's one of the oldest living uh, nutritionists. Anyhow, so in a carnivore diet, if you did it right, if you didn't go to your local butcher shop, grocery store, and buy factory meat, and to these guys' credit, they want you to eat nose to tail, which in in Europe has been done since people were eating animals, mm-hmm. um, it was always nose to tail. You used you know, everything but the oink, as it used to be described. Uh, that's not done in, you know, in some people call it a, an Atkins diet is a, is a dirty carnivore diet or a dirty keto diet. So I think it's, I think if you want to do it as a short term solution for, uh, helping to heal gut, getting lectins out of your system. I have nothing against it. Do I think it is a long-term strategy? No. And here's the reason I think that's true. Number one, there is not a long-lived society ever described or ever found that follows a carnivore diet. There aren't any. And all of the long-lived societies that we know of, including where I spent most of my career, Loma Linda, California, the only blue zone in the United States, eats a primarily plant-based diet. And I propose in the longevity paradox that the commonality of all the blue zones is actually very little animal protein. Uh, The commonality is they don't all eat beans. They don't all eat grains. Um, I'm sorry, that's just not true. Two of those societies use a liter of olive oil per week, and several of them don't use any olive oil. So, uh, But all of them have very little animal protein in their diet, and that gets back down to stimulating this receptor uh, mTOR, but we can talk about that for hours. Uh, mTOR is fascinating. <laughs> in the interest of your time, because I know you're going to have to go soon, my last question, I'm going to forgo my traditional six and ask about wine. Come full circle here. You mentioned earlier glyphosate and wine. I know you visited Europe quite frequently, actually. Yes. And you still drink wine. How, yep. how much should people be drinking and what should they look for in terms of type, like varietal, um, maybe even country, if you don't mind commenting there? Well, it's interesting. Um, there are actually are a few individuals who have shown that red wine, drinking red wine does not affect ketosis, mm-hmm. which is actually good news. Um, I really look for organic or preferably biodynamic uh, vineyards. Uh, they are far more prevalent in Europe, particularly France and Italy, um, Spain as well. Uh, Austria has a number of biodynamic vineyards now that I've visited. And I drink uh, mostly French and Italian wines. Uh, there are, there's an increasing movement for organic and biodynamic 
in California and certainly in Washington State and Oregon. Good news is that the organic California wines uh, seem to have very limited glyphosate. If, if any, there's a couple that do, but it's caused by drift mm -hmm. from fields that um, you know, are being sprayed on either side. So uh, I'll, I'll give you the best example of what's the right amount. Uh, first of all, in Europe, wine is part of is beverage is served with a meal. Mm -hmm. uh, in in the United States, unfortunately, we use wine as a pre meal, um, um, and wine any alcohol uh, in itself uh, can cause leaky gut, and uh, we we have to be aware of that. On the other hand, uh, as I talk about in the longevity paradox, there was a gentleman by the name of Luigi Carneros in the 1500s who wrote a book um, that he died at 102. And he basically followed a calorie-restricted diet at the age of 65 onward. And he wrote a chapter in this book every 10 years to show people how to do this. And it's uh, it's really Kind of interesting was called How to Live to Be a Hundred, a guide to the sober life. And when I first picked it up, I went, Oh dear, this is too bad. Um, you know, you got to be sober to do this. Mm -hmm. uh, but Luigi had 500 mLs of good red wine every day of his life. So, wow, <laughs> two thirds, of, you know, two thirds of a bottle of red wine. So, uh, you know, uh, do not do this experiment at home. Uh, <laughs> professional wine drinker on a closed course. No, but I think it's fascinating that here's a guy who actually really did the first description of intermittent fasting, calorie restriction, and he lived 102 in the 1500s is pretty doggone impressive. That's amazing. And he's actually tied for the oldest living nutritionist uh, in Western society, Ansel Keys. Ansel Keys also lived to 102. And fun <laughs> fact Ansel Keys from the University of Minnesota retired to Italy to a town south of Naples, just above Acciaroli, which is the longest living village in the world. And so, and he drank a lot of olive oil and had some red wine. So he's a there you go. pretty controversial figure in himself, but yes, he is. And we'll, uh, I think we'll leave the controversy for another time. Dr. Gundry, where I, you're incredibly easy to find online, but where would you like the listeners to go to? So then go to drgundry.com. Um, you can also go to gundrymd.com, which is my supplement line. You can find my books everywhere. They've been translated into uh, 36 foreign languages at last count. So uh, pretty easy to find, even in Lithuanian. <laughs> wow. Wow. That's an exotic one. Dr. Gundry, this has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for the education and taking the time. Thanks for having me on. And maybe we'll come back and go down on another rabbit hole. Next oh, time. mTOR sounds like a good one. That's for sure. All right, superhumans. As I mentioned at the beginning, I only got to really drill down on one topic with Dr. Gundry today. And a man with this much knowledge, I could talk to him for hours. So, if you want them back for a round two, please email me, podcast at decodingsuperhuman.com. If you enjoyed this episode or just want your friends to listen to it, share it on all the socials, Facebook, Instagram, tag Decoding Superhuman. I'd love to hear from you guys. Dr. Gundry covered a lot, right? We got into lectins. We got into glyphosate and wine. And I'm sure there are certainly a few habits that I'm going to reevaluate after this podcast. If you head over to iTunes and leave us a five-star rating on the way out, it's extremely appreciated. Again, the show notes for this episode are decodingsuperhuman.com slash Dr. Gundry, and I hope you enjoyed it. Superhumans, have an absolutely epic day. <laughs>